If everyone could please have a seat. We have some, some folks waiting to get in. Volume, need some volume. We have some folks waiting to get in yet, and we just want to get a, get a sense of how many seats are available. So if everyone could have a seat, we'll, we'll get started here in just a few minutes. Wow. Grand, Rap Grand Rapids crowd really shows up to hear about our Dutch presidents. <laughs> we'll get started in just a minute here. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Bill Anderson, the director of the Michigan Department of History, Arts, and Libraries, and tonight it is my special privilege to be a stand-in for Gleaves Whitney. When I was appointed as the founding director of the department nearly six years ago, Gleaves was the principal speechwriter for Governor John Engler, and we developed a great friendship and I have great respect for Gleaves and his scholarship, his passion about history, and his leadership. So this is special for me to stand in his place. In my previous life and career, I spent 33 years in higher education, much of it in Michigan, and I remember when Grand Valley State University began, began humbly. And when I think about what it has become, I am so proud of this university. It has truly become one of the great universities in this state. And I'm equally proud that I have an honorary doctorate degree from this institution. I know that in the audience tonight there are many prominent people, but since I'm a fill-in, I don't know who all of you are, so you will excuse me. But I do know that we have a prominent member of our legislature here tonight and one of the reasons that Tweed Roosevelt is here is that for the last two days, we have been celebrating the centennial of President Theodore Roosevelt coming to Michigan, specifically to Lansing. And the person who had the vision for the celebration and provided the leadership and the driving force was Senator Cameron Brown. Cameron, would you stand up and be acknowledged, please? Now it's my privilege to introduce our special guest and keynote speaker this evening. Tweed Roosevelt, the great grandson of President Theodore Roosevelt and nephew of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is the principal trustee of the Roosevelt Trust and chairman of the Roosevelt China Investment Corporation. Tomorrow, after we take him to the airport at 9 o'clock in the morning, he will start his journey to China. He has had extensive experience assisting business in building their operations as a business consultant and as an investor. He also is the managing director of the Roosevelt Investment Group, established in 1971 and currently manages over $1 billion. Mr. Roosevelt was formerly the executive director of the Institute for Quantitative Research and Finance at the Graduate School of Business at Columbia University and is presently an officer at Harvard University. He holds a BA from Harvard College and an MBA from Columbia University where he has also taught in both the graduate and the executive programs. And then if you'll allow me in this introduction to be a little bit autobiographical, I consider that I came from common stock in America, but I so appreciate the great blessings of this nation and the opportunities that it has given me. But when I think about Tweed Roosevelt, he came from noble stock. 
and I hope that you are impressed with his resume and credentials. But having spent a couple of days with him, I am so impressed that given his lineage, he is just a regular person. Please join me in welcoming Tweed Roosevelt. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Is this thing on? Can you hear me? Oh, good. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here. I never recognize myself when people give introductions uh, <laughs> at, about me. <clears throat> and I suppose for the record, I ought to correct some of the errors in uh, Bill's thing. Uh, I had a cousin who ran for governor of Massachusetts, and uh, he, among other things, had somehow somebody had said he was nephew of FDR. Uh, or that, but we're not nephews. Uh, it's actually something like, oh, geez, uh, we're fifth cousins. Now, how many of you know your fifth cousins? Uh, <laughs> so it's a long way. Actually, TR and FDR were fifth cousins, so I'm fifth cousin, what, three times removed? Uh, <laughs> Eleanor, however, was my, let's see, first cousin three times removed, because Eleanor, as some of you may or may not know, was T.R.'s niece, his brother's daughter. The Roosevelts married Roosevelts. You know, they said, you didn't have to change the, uh, you know, the monograms if you, if you did that. And it kept the money in the family, somebody said. So <laughs> lots of reasons to marry each other. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and this uh, one, was, I can't say that I knew much about this institution before I arrived, but I've certainly been impressed not only with this institution, which I've seen a little bit of, but I spent this morning in the, uh, in the Senate, I made an address to the, uh, to the Senate, which they were kind enough to listen politely to, and uh, what a gorgeous building that is. I was really impressed. Uh, and uh, it, I hadn't really, it was something like 10, 15 years ago, it was renovated, it looks like it was renovated yesterday. I guess you ought to be, I'm sure you are very proud of that. Well, let's see, I ought to get some housekeeping things out of the way to begin with. Uh, Yes, Tweed is my real name. Uh, it's, I'm not a Theodore, I'm not anything. Tweed is my real name. It's my mother's maiden name. Uh, and another thing, just to save embarrassment here, no, I did not know my great-grandfather. He died in 1919, and I hope you don't think that I knew my great-grandfather. Uh, in fact, my father was one year old when, when T.R. died, so uh, just so nobody embarrasses themselves with that. One of your reporters, a sweet young thing last night, uh, uh, interviewed me, and in spite of the fact that I had just told her, by answer of some question, that T.R. died in 1919, she su succeeded in next asking me if I knew him. And now, <laughs> When this usually happens, it's somebody in the audience, so I can just try to shame them. But she was right there. I grabbed her around the neck, <laughs> which I've been dying to do for some time, uh, and was finally hauled off her by the cameraman. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> uh, the, one of the nice things about talking in the Senate today is I gather that the political times have had a bit of turmoil here lately. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't know much about that, but it was pleasant to be able to talk to them about something that both sides of the aisle could feel comfortable and happy about and, and, and clap, because although T.R. was a Republican, he's really now become a national icon and is quoted by both Republicans and Democrats. And so it gave him a little respite, and uh, I did talk about some things about leadership, and I hope they heard some of those things, Senator. Uh, and. Uh, uh, so I hope they're in a little better mood now and maybe they can solve our problems. Although we all know what it was that Mark Twain has said, that nobody's safe when Congress is in session. Uh, so we'll see. Well, <coughs> my job here is to talk about something entirely different than I talked about today. So any of those who are here will hear a different story. I'm here to talk to you about uh, Theodore Roosevelt's after the presidency uh, and after his run for the Bull Moose campaigns, trip to Brazil down the River of Doubt, and then my retracing of that in 1992. Uh, it was, uh, I, well, where shall I start? Uh, I knew about this trip. 
you know, if you read about TR and you know, something about the family, you hear a little bit about it, you knew it was kind of an arduous trip. And I knew a little about it, but I didn't know much about it. And you know, fantasizing in the same way I fantasize every time I watch a Western movie, and um, you know, there I am with Jimmy Stewart uh, uh, walking along, backing him up for Frank Miller. Uh, I had fantasized, uh, <laughs> fantasized going down this river. And uh, uh, so that was fine, it was easy to do, I didn't have to worry much about it. Uh, well, one day I got a call, and this guy I'd never heard of before announced that uh, he was going to retrace the trip in Brazil. And would I be interested in coming along? And I listened to him talk, and he sort of had a sales pitch and everything, and I kind of made a snap judgment. First of all, he said it was going to be at least two years before we did that, and that seemed to me an interminable amount of time. Uh, and second of all, I listened to him and you know, I said to myself, this guy's never going to pull this off. This guy's an incompetent. He's never going to pull it off. And so why not agree? I can get all the pleasure of saying I would have done this and then it would fizzle out at the end and you know, it would be fine. I mean, look at me. I'm not the explorer type. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, what you see is what you got. Um, <laughs> My friends on Beacon Hill, when they heard I was going to do this, were astounded because they thought that the most adventurous thing I might ever do was take the garbage out on Beacon Hill. Uh, so, uh, you know, it seemed like a safe thing to do. Well, my first assignment was to look in depth at TR's trip. And so I'll tell you a little about it. Uh, when TR ran as a third party bull, third party bull moose campaign uh, in the bull moose campaign for presidency, and lost uh, in 1912, he looked around for something to do. And TR typically in his history, when you know, he had major disappointments in losing that election was a major disappointment. When he had major disappointments, he'd go on some, you know, some adventurous trip. I mean, for example, when he was a young man in his 20s, newly married, uh, he had a wife, he was a, in the state legislature in New York, his family lived in New York City, and the legislature met in Albany, the state capital. And uh, so he would go up to Albany during the week, and he'd come back down on the weekends. Well, Alice, his uh, wife, became pregnant. Uh, and as she approached the uh, term of her pregnancy, in those days you didn't go to hospitals to give birth to babies. You didn't go to hospitals for any other reason other than to die in those days. They were extremely dangerous places to be. Uh, and so traditionally what happened is women stayed home and often some of the older women came in to take care. In this case, T.R.'s mother. T.R. was very close to his mother. His father had died while he was in college uh, and, uh, you know, he was close to his mother. So he was up in Albany and he got a telegram that said, congratulations, you know, you're a father of a healthy little baby girl. It was on a Wednesday or so and uh, uh, everything's fine. So he figured he'd finish out the week up there then come down as usual after the session was over. Well, later that day he got a telegram saying things don't look so good, you better get home as fast as you can. So he got on a train, it happened to be very bad weather, he didn't get to New York City till well past midnight. When he got to his house, his brother was waiting for him on the stoop and his brother said, there's a you know, tragedy in the making here, uh, you're wife is dying and so is our mother. Uh, and later that day both his mother and his wife died. Uh, which as you can imagine was a, uh, an incredible blow. Uh, he uh, uh, was reeling under this. They had a double funeral in uh, one of the churches in New York. He decided to play out his uh, uh, term in, in uh, the legislature which was almost over. And then he decided to remake himself and that's when he moved to North Dakota and became a rancher. Um, and so, you know, that's how he handled that situation. It's a whole long story, which I don't have time to go in about that, but uh, that's one of the ways he dealt with it. Uh, when he left the White House, the first time, you know, when he left the White House, what he did is he went to Africa for 10 months on a collecting hunting expedition, the collecting expedition for the uh, Smithsonian. So he had a sort of a history of this. And so when he lost the uh, the campaign, the Bull Moose campaign, he decided to go South America. He'd been invited to give a bunch of speeches, so he would give a bunch of speeches. And he had kind of a vague idea that he would do some sort of adventure travel, but nothing really spectacular. Uh, his idea of adventure travel 
was to go down the Tapajos, one of the longest tributaries of the Amazon, to the Amazon, up to Manaus, up the Rio Negro, across the land canal there to the Venezuelan River, and then down to the Caribbean, which has, still has never been done. But in his mind was a, uh, you know, it was, it was still a well-worn route. It wasn't adventurous in any in, in, in sense of exploration. Well, when he arrived, he was going to give speeches around South America. When he arrived in Brazil, Brazil saw this as an opportunity, and they thought they had the bait for him. The opportunity was to get him involved in something. Now, Brazil at that time was inhabited all along the coast, but they had a huge central area that was pretty well undiscovered uh, of this, you know, the, the Amazon basin. And so uh, they had sort of their equivalent to Lewis and Clark, a guy named Colonel Candido Rondon, who was going in and discovering things. But it, unlike, unlike Lewis and Clark that made one long expeditions, he made many. And he had just returned and discovered what appeared to be the headwaters of a, uh, a new river, an undiscovered river. Uh, and it, it wasn't supposed to be any river there because the map makers had put the two nearest rivers closer together and uh, strung a mountain range along there, which didn't exist, but they'd put it there. <laughs> and so the river, it didn't look like it belonged there. Now, they didn't know whether this river just went a short way and then into one of the others or whether it was a long river. But Rondon was going back, and, and uh, Laurel Miller, who was the foreign minister, suggested to TR that he join this expedition. Well, that's like being asked if you wanted to go with Lewis and Clark. And TR, who was 50 and out of shape, and a little bigger even than me, uh, jumped at the, at the idea. Now, he was ill-prepared. Most of his other trips, all of his other trips, he'd been very well prepared for. But he was fairly ill-prepared for this, but so be it. Well, he went and gave his speeches, and then they took uh, a boat up uh, the, uh, the uh, Paraguay River for you know, several weeks, and they got up to the high area above the Amazon, and then they started, he met Colonel Rondon, and they started on their expedition. So first they had to cover the Alto Plano, which is a high, sort of dry, chaparral kind of country. And they had oxen and mules and all their stuff, uh, and they went across this. It took them a month, and the oxen started dying. The lots of stuff was left around the area, you know, and everything. So that by the time they got to the headwaters of the river, they were always already significantly diminished. Uh, they started down the river, and they consisted of T.R., uh, his well, his second son Kermit, and a naturalist from the American Museum of Natural History who was going to collect on the trip. He always took, or often took, naturalists with him when he went on this kind of trip. And on the Brazilian side, there was Colonel Rondon, there was uh, a map maker, Lieutenant Lyre, and then there was a doctor. You know, you need a doctor on an expedition like this. Well, the problem was this doctor wasn't particularly well prepared. The only piece of equipment he had was a stethoscope. <laughs> uh, so this would play in the story as we went on here. And then they had, I think it was 19 paddlers and dugout canoes. So they started down the river, and before long, uh, they began to come to rapids. So they had to drag the canoes around the rapids. They went on a little further. Now their plan was, they had no idea how long this expedition was going to be. You know, you know, you don't know when you're on an uh, exploration trip. They figured it'd take about two months, but they only took enough food for one month. Uh, well, the theory was that they would hunt along the way, and they would eat Brazil nuts. <laughs> now, I don't know if any of you ever tried to open a Brazil nut. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't seem very promising as a, as a sort of way to sustain yourself. But you can make Brazil nuts. You can open it finely. Uh, and, and what you don't know is Brazil nuts come in this iron hard coconut kind of thing that you have to get in first before you try to get into the Brazil nut. Uh, you can pound it up and make a powder and make kind of a bread out of it. Well, the problem was that they went on the rainy season, and so it was flooded forest there. There was no game, and the Brazil nuts were having an off year. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty soon it became very clear to them that they had to cut back on their rations. 
and they cut back and they cut back. And, you know, they got down to quarter rations, and that was a real problem. And you can imagine about morale. The next thing happened is disease struck, uh, and they started getting sick dysentery and related things. Now, that wasn't very pleasant. Uh, and then the rapids. Well, they got into a rapid. Kermit was in a dugout with one of the paddlers and his dog, and he got caught in the top of the rapids, and the boat was rolled over. They were dumped in. Kermit almost died. The paddler was never seen. That's what happens when you go in the water in the Amazon, because the, on the side, the trees go over the edge. You don't see the banks of it. The trees go over the edge. So if you get drowned in the river, you're, uh, you're just swept under there and somebody eats you. Uh, so they never found him again. Uh, this, of course, severely upset Theodore Roosevelt, who was not at all anxious to lose his son in the Amazon. His son was due to get married as soon as this was over. Uh, and so that didn't seem like a particularly good idea. Uh, they started getting uh, sicker. And then the food was really running out. And there was a substantial chance that they were going to starve to death. Uh, well, at one time at one of the camps, uh, one of the paddlers, who was kind of the sergeant, caught one of the other paddlers stealing food. And there was a fracas. The, pad the thief picked up a rifle, shot the sergeant dead, uh, and ran off into the woods. Uh, they tried to track him down, didn't. There was a big fight about whether they should or shouldn't, another story. Uh, and he was never seen again. They, as they went by the rapids often, they, they found Indian pests. They never saw an Indian on the trip, but they were constantly dogged by the Indians. The Indians let them know they were there. They uh, uh, would, you could hear them talking to each other or making sounds to each other. Uh, Ron Don once was going with his, with his dog ahead of him. He heard the dog squeal. Dog came running back full of arrows, <laughs> dropped dead. And the Indians put out these do not enter signs that even the st stupidest of of explorers could recognize. For example, as you walk around a, 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 a falls, there was a little Indian path. In the middle of the Indian path was a severed head of a bleeding head of a monkey full of arrows. Now, you know what that means. <laughs> so, so they constantly had this pressure of the Indians and the pressure of, the, uh, of running out of food and the pressure of the, of the falls and the uh, uh, disease. TR got so sick. Two things happened. One is he'd had an accident years before, banged his thigh, got an a anaerobic infection in the bone, which even today the doctors will tell you is very hard to treat because you uh, can't get the, uh, the uh, antibiotics in to deal with the uh, bacterial infection, bacterial infection, I mean. And so the doctor who had nothing but a stethoscope uh, and no anesthetic cut TR open to the bone and scraped the bone. Uh, uh, TR is a tough old nut. Uh, well, TR survived that. Now, as I heard this, well, TR survived that, uh, but became, you know, delirious and so on. There were times when uh, his son and Ron Don didn't think he was going to make it through the night. He would become delirious and kept quoting in Xanadu, did Kublai Khan, um, over and over again. Uh, pretty grim, all this. Well, uh, in fact, uh, years later, T.R. said that whenever he went on an expedition like this, he always took enough morphine to kill himself. And the reason he did that, he said, was that, A, if he found himself, he often went alone on trips in the West and so on. If he found him a place where he was going to have a slow, lingering death, he could at least speed it up a little bit. Uh, but more importantly, if he was with a group and he felt that his, their trying to save him uh, would substantial risk for the group, he could free them up to go on. He said, the only time I ever thought of using it was on that Brazil trip. And the only reason I didn't use it was I knew that my son would take me out dead or alive, and it was marginally easier for him to take me out alive. <laughs> uh, well, after two months, they staggered out at the bottom of the river. I mean, I guess you get the idea of what this trip was like. Uh, they staggered out at the bottom of the river TR 55 pounds lighter. Now that was, you remember I'm doing the research on all this, that was the first bit of good news I'd heard about the whole trip. <laughs> you know, at least it could be a weight loss clinic for me. Uh, well, doing all this research, uh, 
uh, you know, I, I began to realize that my judgment of the organizer had been seriously flawed and that the two years were about past and that it looked like he was actually going to pull this whole thing together. And so I was kind of looking for a way out of this. And I had two little kids, and that seemed to be a glimmer of hope because I had these two little kids. And my wife was saying to me, you know, you can't, it's irresponsible. And my mother said, you can't do this. You know, what happens? You get killed. And blah, blah, blah. They'd read the stories too. And so I looked like I'd kind of found a way out until mother made a serious tactical error. One day she asked me, she said, Tweed, do you know why your great grandfather went on this trip? And I knew the story, but I said, yes, mother, you know, tell me. And she said, well, he said it, it was because it was his last chance to be a boy. Now I knew that. And she said, do you know why you're going on this? <laughs> and, uh, with some trepidation, I said, well, uh, I don't know, mother. What? She said, because it's your first chance to be a man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I had no choice at that stage. I had to go. Uh, so let's see if we can make this equipment. I have a whole bunch of slides here for you and uh, some equipment here which may or may not work. Uh, there we go. Can you see that? Are the lights okay? Is, you can see that? Can you see it? Say no if you mean no. No. Let's see if I can get the attention of the guys back there. Can you turn some of the lights out? I'll try to keep something on me so I'm not completely in the dark. Uh, this voice emerging from the doom here. Uh, is anything happening? Yeah. Uh, is it getting better? And I can't see the focus, so if it doesn't look focused, somebody yell. I've got yell. It's not focused. Okay. Uh, you may have trouble on the sides. I'm sorry. Uh, now I've got. To, I'm the kind of guy who can't chew gum and walk at the same time, so I got to make sure I got these two things right. Yeah, here we go. I thought we'd start with a map of where we're going. Uh, First, this <laughs> is Brazil, in case you didn't notice. Uh, the Amazon basin is here, uh, and it's an extraordinary river. It's, well, how do you talk about what's the biggest river in the world? The first thing, you've got several ways of looking at it. One is the length. Uh, this is about 4,000 miles. The Nile is about 4,000 miles. You can make each, either one longer if you sort of measure it slightly differently. Because the Amazon rises right here almost in the Pacific, well, it's about here, and goes all the way around and down. So from the point of view of length, it's, uh, it's got an argument with the Nile. And another thing they measure in rivers is drop. You know, the people who do white water and so on, how much it drops per mile. And the Amazon is extraordinary for this because for the first, well, whatever distance it is, in the, in the Andes, it's 35 feet a mile is the drop, just one waterfall after another, until it gets down to the big basin here, uh, uh, sort of right about here, at about Iquitos. And the drop, which is, this is about 2,000 miles, the drop uh, from Iquitos to the Atlantic is less than half an inch a mile. So it's two very different rivers. Uh, but the major way you, you measure a river is the amount of water. Uh, this has nine times the water of the Mississippi. You could put nine Mississippis in it. And another statistic is one-fifth of all the fresh water in all the world, including the Great Lakes and everywhere else you can think of, one-fifth of all the water in the world is in the Amazon Basin. Uh, and almost a third of the war rain that falls there, water that falls into the Amazon, is recycled by uh, going back up into the clouds and going back up. The deepest river Rhine point in the world is 1,000 miles upriver here and is over 100 meters, over 300 feet deep. Uh, the width of it, if you, right here, for example, the Amazon is wider than the English Channel. Uh, and in this flat area, even though the drop is only a half an inch a mile, the current runs at five knots you know, often. It's an incredible place with incredible diversity. Uh, some of the diversity, we stayed in a little tiny sort of, you might call it a hotel in, in Manaus, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, and it had behind it a pond that was about the size of this auditorium. And in that pond, there were more species of fish 
than in all of Europe from Portugal to the Urals. And things were typical like that. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about mo some more of this stuff. Uh, I call those gee whizzes. <laughs> and you can, you can go on at length about the gee whizzes that are in the Amazon. Now, uh, let's get oriented here a little bit. Uh, we flew to a city called Manaus. Uh, and if you look carefully here, you see these red lines? That's what National Geographic thought were roads. But in fact, there aren't any roads there. At least there weren't in 1992. And so you couldn't get around by that. And we had to use other means. But we flew to there. And eventually, let's see if I can find this right, uh, we managed to work our way up to here, uh, which was the headwaters, or clear near the headwaters of the Rio uh, Roosevelt, the, the Duvida, as they called it then, the River of Doubt. Uh, and we went uh, downriver like that, down here, and then eventually to Manaus. And we'll see more about that. But one thing's important to recognize, if you're going to go on a river, exploring, if you will, or at least adventuring, make sure you go down, <laughs> not up. Uh, big difference, big difference. Well, uh, let's see here. There's Manaus. Uh, let me tell you a little about Manaus. Uh, Manaus was founded in the 1870s, 1880s, as part of the rubber boom. What happened was we started to need rubber. You people around here know something about automobiles. It was actually first bicycle tires and then automobiles. But there was a world demand for rubber. And we could only get it in those days from taking sap from wild rubber trees, which didn't grow in big groups, but were all around the forest. So the uh, rubber barons got a corner on it here, because the only rubber trees available at that time were in the Amazon. And so Manaus became a boom town because it was sort of like oil in the Middle East now. You know, they had the complete control, they could charge anything they wanted for rubber. So it was a tremendous boom town. But it was a frontier, <coughs> a very funny kind of boom town. And there are wonderful stories about the place. One of the stories is that it had a mayor. And the mayor, you know, they had all this money, municipal money. The mayor built this magnificent uh, mansion for his wife. Uh, and just as he completed the mansion, the, the good citizens of Manaus decided he was no good and elected a new mayor. <laughs> so the new mayor came in, and he wasn't going to have his wife live in somebody else's house. And so he got these big barrels of dynamite, blew up the house, <laughs> and built another one. <laughs> it's nice to have all that money. Uh, another thing, the good ladies, many of them Portuguese, uh, in Brazil, would send regularly, this is, a, remember, a thousand miles upriver here, would regularly send their laundry to Portugal <laughs> to be done. Uh, and finally, the, the says, you know, it, it's a very interesting town, the first town to have a, a municipal lighting system the first town in the world, the first town to have a trolley system and so on. But it was very small, there were not many people lived there. Somebody decided that you can't be a world-class city unless you have an opera house. Why they ever thought they would ever be a world-class city, I don't know. But they decided to build themselves an opera house. And this is what they built. <laughs> Pretty extraordinary. Uh, well, if you got an opera house, you need to have an opera company to sing in the opera house. Well, nobody in Manaus knew anything about opera. Nobody, of course, could sing. So they searched the world for an opera company that was foolish enough to, to book themselves <laughs> a thousand miles upriver in the Amazon. Well, nobody, Caruso turned them down. You know, all these people turned them down. They finally found somebody to come. It must have been you know, about a fifth-rate company, Italian company. But they arrived. And they came, and they put on an opera. Now, this seats, uh, I forget, it's about 2,000 people at seats. I think there were only 20,000 people in Manaus at the time. Uh, but anyway, they were going to put on this opera. Now, history at least, I've been unable to discover what opera they put on. But apparently it was successful, you know. And for eight days, it was a big, smashing success. And on the ninth day, half the cast of the opera died of yellow fever. Uh, <laughs> so there's never been an opera <laughs> there since. Uh, <laughs> but they have a beautiful <laughs> opera house. If you know any company that's really desperate, <laughs> I'm sure they'd be delighted. Now, as I said, the only way you could get around there was by boat. 
because the roads, of course, then and the roads now didn't exist. And uh, everything was, when I was there, it was done by boat. Even gasoline stations were on the boat. This is the mayor's boat. And I love it because, see, they have not forgotten TR. It's called the President Roosevelt. Now, this, this is the captain. That's me. Uh, this looks like it's a pleasant greeting. Actually, it's a desperate struggle. He's trying to get me to go up this gangplank. Look at it, it's soaking wet. <laughs> and I'm trying to get him to come down because I'm damned if I'm going up that. Uh, look where it goes. I mean, you know, there was no way I was going to be able to get it up that without falling off. Uh, well, I won. <laughs> uh, now, I said Manaus is a thousand miles upriver. The flat part goes another thousand miles to Iquitos. And you can take ocean liners, and here's one of them, a, a container ship. You can't quite read the fantail, but the fantail home port is Iquitos. And that's like taking a uh, 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 ship from New York to, uh, to the Rocky Mountains, to Denver. Uh, and they can do that. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a, a absolutely extraordinary. Well, let's talk again a little bit about my trip. Uh, here we are working on uh, you know the stuff we were going to take, uh, but that's not what really interested me. What really interested me is what I was going to take. <laughs> now I had been told by the organizers that I was my allotment was 44 pounds. Uh, we didn't know how long we'd be on the river, but we calculated something like a month. Uh, 44 pounds, well, 44 pounds, as far as I was concerned, was about how many pounds of books I wanted to take on this trip. Uh, well, I didn't know anything about traveling in the, you know, these kinds of worlds, in this kind of conditions. So I did what any intelligent person ought to do. I went out and found, from people who were experienced in this, lists of what you ought to take. And I got a whole bunch of lists, including one in, in the back of TR's book on this subject. So I had five lists to compare. So I looked at them all, you know, and compared them. And the only thing that was common to all five lists was an umbrella, <laughs> uh, which seemed to me kind of a ridiculous thing to take. But anyway, uh, so I went to Eastern Mountain Sports, you know, all these stores. And I bought everything that I thought was supposed to be necessary. And I had a mountain, you know. There was no way I could say this thing weighed 44 pounds, a mountain of stuff. And I started reducing the way, you know, you read about people doing this, reducing. Each time you reduced, you reduced to what you thought was absolutely essential, and you reduced again. Well, by the time I got onto the airplane, I had 44 kilos. And I thought I could get away with that, uh, you know, pounds, kilos, maybe I misunderstood. Well, here I'm trying to reduce it to 44 pounds, which I did succeed in doing, and actually, you really don't need very much anyway. I thought I'd introduce you to some of the characters involved with this. Uh, this is the guy, the, org the guy that called me up on the telephone. So I got the absolute worst picture. He's the guy that got me into this mess. So I got the worst picture of Charlie. Uh, we uh, also, we were going through, now let me tell you a little about this region, uh, the area. Uh, TR's trip was the first trip, obviously, down there. There is a group of Indians known outside as the Centralarga Indians, tough, tough Indians. As I said, TR was threatened but never actually attacked by them. Uh, they had controlled it continuously. Now, TR went down in 1913-14, and uh, uh, between that and 1927 or 28, I guess it was 1928, two other expeditions tried to go down this river. One was a Brazilian expedition, and one was an American expedition. The Brazilian expedition started out at the top and never came out at the bottom. Nobody ever saw them again. Uh, the American expedition went down, got some way down, and was chased back by the Indians. And in 1928, a small group uh, commissioned by the Theodore Roosevelt Association decided uh, to go down this river. The reason the Theodore Roosevelt Association commissioned them was because of this perennial battle between the National Geographic in the United States and the Royal Geographic in England. And the Royal Geographic had let it be known that they didn't believe that TR had actually done this. This came as a big surprise to TR, who pointed out rather sensibly that he was at the top and he was at the bottom, and there wasn't any other way to get around it. 
you know, there was no, you remember Rosie Ruiz, any of you remember her? She was the marathon woman who took the, took the subway. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, the Boston Marathon. Well, there was no subway between the top and bottom. But anyway, the TRA sent this group down, and that was successful in 1928. Between 1928 and 1992, nobody had been down this river. And the Brazilians had decided to make it a huge Indian reserve, which the Central Larga, although contacted to the outside world, uh, defended viciously. Uh, a lot of sort of thuggy kinds of Brazilian gold miners and diamond miners would break in there and the Indians would chase them out. And in fact, the year before we went, 13 of the miners were killed in different incidences by the Indians. Some say murdered, I say justifiably killed by the Indians. Uh, so we decided that we better have somebody come along with us who could say to the Indians, say, don't worry about these fellows, you know, they're just passing through, they're not going to take your diamonds. So we got two Central Larga Indians to accompany us and they were absolutely wonderful, magnificent people. And that was Otomita, one of them. Uh, and I may say a few things later about him, too. We also took three Brazilian scientists with us. No scientists had been able to go in there to collect. And so uh, three of them did. Uh, we took a biologist, a uh, ethnobotanist who studied, supposedly was going to study how the locals used things, but since we didn't spend any time with locals, he didn't have much to do. Uh, and an ichthyologist, a fish guy. And there were lots of fish, so that was good. He was tough. Uh, also, <laughs> he's a New Yorker. <laughs> That's Mark. He's a photojournalist, and so he's responsible for all these, or most of these pictures. It was really a wonderful guy. This is a butterfly that had, we called it Glenda, that fell in love with him, I guess, and stuck with him for two days. <laughs> uh, and you see a great picture. We decided to take a doctor, too, and somewhat more experienced doctor than the uh, than the Brazilian doctor that preceded us. Uh, so John Walden, uh, I found, he's uh, a professor at, uh, in West Virginia at, uh, you know, name of the schools just escaped me in the West, the one they just made that movie about where the plane went down with all those students. Marshall, Marshall, he's, he's at Marshall. And uh, uh, he was experienced. We weren't all complete ninnies in this. He, First of all, I knew a lot about tropical medicine and also a lot about, you know, regular GP medicine. Uh, but he was also, ever since he's been a kid, he'd been in love with the whole region. And every year or so, you know, sometimes twice a year, he would trek with the Indians, himself alone with the Indians for miles, for days. So this was going to be something like his 45th trip or whatever it was. So he knew what he was talking about. And uh, he certainly could deal with our problems. We also uh, uh, took the first women that went down. We had Avon boats, rafts, you know, whitewater rafts, you've seen them. Uh, they were supplied to us by a company. We had five of them, and we had five boat people. One of the boat people was Kelly, right here, and she was about this tall. And if you've ever been in one of those things, you know they have those 10-foot oars in the rapids. It's really a tough thing. She was, and she was able to do that with fully loaded, you know, very heavy rafts. Uh, she was, uh, but she was also, it was nice to have her, we had two women, and she was uh, one of them. Nice to have some women along, who was kind of smooth over this sort of fraternity type group that we had otherwise. Now you may think that's a bad picture because of the, her color, but actually what sh she's doing there is this plant, which has a seed that you can, that produces a red uh, color that the Indians use for war paint, and it was also reputed to be uh, a good thing to keep the insects away. Uh, but if you want to know, we did wear it. You want to know why we wore it? We wore it because it made us feel like we looked like explorers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's get on with it here. I said there were no roads. That's not quite true. There was uh, some road work. This was not very far there, but this was about the only piece of that road that looked anything like a road. The reason I have this picture is you can see the difference between what's primary jungle there and degraded jungle. But this road didn't last long and became more like that. And that didn't last long either. And you began to run into this kind of problem. Uh, now, the, the good news or the bad news about this is obviously this. And not only is that a great big tree, but it's what, you know, one of those ironwood trees. And you know, if you, if you took a big ax, a double-headed ax, and swung it as hard as you can with that uh, and hit it solidly, your teeth would fall out. 
Uh, I mean, you just couldn't get anywhere with it. But the good news was the mud down here, so that we were able to dig our way through that. Uh, but the problem with the Amazon is that good news often switches very quickly to bad news. You began to run in that. Now, we were working our way to the headwaters, at first through farm roads uh, or something. And we had, uh, we had a bunch of trucks, these little trucks here. And when we were in the village, which was about 30 miles from there, we were looking for drivers for this truck. And so we wanted Brazilian drivers to drive our trucks. Uh, and so we put out an offer for, you know, we pay so much to do this. Well, our reputation had preceded us as crazy gringos who were not likely to survive very long here. So we couldn't get anybody to drive the trucks. Now, and so we raised the money and we raised it. Finally, we raised the money so high that five drivers appeared willing, were so desperate <laughs> that they were willing to do it for the money. Well, they drove until this point where they concluded that their friends were correct about their analysis of our <laughs> sanity. Uh, and they are, they abandoned us here and they're walking over the hill back to home, which was quite a long way to go, which showed their commitment to getting away from us. Uh, and this happened. <laughs> uh, it really got to be quite a mess. Well, the next thing was we had to build our own road uh, and uh, through the jungle. Now, what you did is you did it with a machete. Now, nobody gave me a machete or I would be a lot shorter now than I was then. Uh, but, uh, uh, and you'll notice what it does when you chop with a machete, I don't know if you can see them, you create these little dagger like sticks of bamboo stuff and you can see the size of the tires. Uh, <laughs> so that we spent a lot of time changing tires, uh, uh, but we managed to get along. Well, uh, you've all heard about what the Amazon is supposed to look like and it, many people you know, think it looks like that. Well, that's a typical sort of slash and burn thing. What a farmer will do at the beginning of the dry season, cut down all the trees and a couple of acres of land, uh, burn the trees, the nutrients will go in the ground, he'd get a couple of rounds of, two, three rounds of crops, and then the land is exhausted, he'd move on. Well, I mean, there is a lot of that, but what we saw was all this. It was just pristine jungle. This is the river of doubt. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned that's what they called it, the river of doubt to begin with, Duvida. Uh, and this is about where we were. It was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, now, what happened, uh, that's a picture. I'll show you some pictures from TR's time and we'll compare the two pictures. That's the same spot in TR's time. What's interesting, they built this little bridge here. It's interesting is the, the jungle looks quite degraded from, from what it looks like now. Uh, there are lots of hazards around. Now, it's hard to tell from this, but these needle-sharp uh, thorns were about six inches long. And, you know, I, I, I like to lean against things. Well, you don't, <laughs> you don't do that much there. Uh, and if you drop something, you know, you don't back around <laughs> like this looking for it. Uh, and we were in rubber rafts. <laughs> uh, I remember that. Uh, now, if you look at this closely, those are caterpillars. Uh, what you can't tell is they're the size of Coney Island hot dogs uh, <laughs> and in their masses here. Uh, and, you know, so they're caterpillars, so what? You figure they might grow up into something like that. That's taken there. It looks just like our tiger swallowtail that you have here. Uh, and that may be true. They may grow up to that. But before that, this might happen. What happened is we got to the river. We've been slugging through the jungle. It's 99 degrees, 99 percent the humidity, and uh, you know we've been chopping our way through. When we got to the river, the first thing we did, the beautiful dark river, cool. We jumped into the river. It was great. So we were in the river, and then this is the ichthyologist. He was the toughest, other than the Indians, he was absolutely the most experienced and toughest guy, and one of the toughest guy I've ever met. He came out of the water and dropped to his knees like this, obviously in great pain. Uh, here's the doctor looking away, I think, as if he was wishing this wasn't really happening. Within 10 minutes, he's lying flat on his back, moaning. You know, he all was coming out of him was moans. And I said to the doctor, my God, you've got to, you know, morale is plunging, do something. He said, I've given him two Demerol shots, 
and nothing, you know, I can't give them any more and they're not doing much. Well, at that point, the Indian, one of the Indians, uh, Otomita, came by and said, oh, he said, yeah, he touched one of those caterpillars. He said, uh, won't kill him, he'll, he'll recover in about six weeks or so. <laughs> it's, it's pretty painful, they said, but compared, you see where you were swimming in there? Compared to the stingrays in there, this is nothing. <laughs> so we didn't go into the water much after that. They were right about him. It took quite a while. He was tough, so he got better quicker, but uh, it didn't kill him, fortunately. But he was in a lot of pain for a long time. Well, here we are. Here's a wonderful picture. There's TR with his pith helmet, overweight, you know, intrepid, <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> well, there I am. <laughs> overweight, pith helmet. <laughs> not so ready to go. <laughs> and the, there's uh, Cabral, the guy who's moaning about the things that had just happened to him. He's barely upright. So uh, down we go. The river was beautiful. Here it's small, little looking good. We, you can see we're in Avon rafts. Uh, that's what I mean by Avon rafts. Look at the size of the oars. Uh, and there's TR. Now, these are dugouts. And look at the freeboard. <laughs> You know, there's a couple of inches freeboard, and off they went. That's almost, we were almost exactly at the same spot that they were. Uh, and the problem with that is you quickly have rapids. And uh, if you look, at, this is today, you look then, wasn't any different, you're going to have a hard time uh, getting down rapids like that. Well, we had Avon rafts. Now, I'm of the theory that if you have to do something that's going to be really unpleasant, why don't you wait and do it when a hat, you know, like a root canal? You don't, you don't do a pre-root canal <laughs> before you do a root canal. So my theory was, I, this was the first time I'd ever been in white water. Uh, and so there we are. Uh, and that uh, you can imagine Kelly with those oars. Now that's tough. Look at the stuff we've got there. Uh, <laughs> you want to know where I am? I'm right there. Uh, <laughs> and it was pretty exciting, I'll have to say. Now the, the white water people, they measure rivers uh, zero to five. And the way to understand why, you know, zero is flat water. Five, I'll say six is you're dead. So five is the surf level. So we went down this first rapid. Now remember, uh, I'll give you a, a calm water picture. Most of the water wasn't rapids. And of course, you went rapidly down the rapids. Uh, when I asked the uh, lead boatman, this guy, very experienced guy. He'd done something like 30 or 40 international whitewater firsts. He specialized in this sort of thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, when I asked him, we went down that first rapids. It was pretty exciting, but, you know, it wasn't heart stopping. And uh, we got to the bottom. I asked Jim what, uh, you know, how he'd rank it. He said, oh, that's a five. Uh, the difference is, if you go on whitewater here in the Grand Canyon or somewhere like that, the, the raft guys have been down it hundreds of times. And they know exactly how to take you, so they give you a big, like a roller coaster thrill. And, uh, you know, worst comes to worst, they flip. Somebody gets hurt, you get them out. These guys, their job was to get us down the river alive. And, uh, you know, nobody had been down these, these rapids in any kind of recent times. And uh, if you got hurt, there was no way to get out. Uh, so their job was to get you down as safe as possible. So they went the easiest way on every rapids instead of the hardest. But it was still pretty interesting because you, typically at rapids you'd have several different branches of the river going down. And although we had a kayak, uh, it was hard to, uh, you know, to exp explore them, particularly in the middle. I mean, you could go down the side and see it from the banks, but you couldn't see the, you know, in the middle because they were islands. And if uh, uh, you know, you remember that tree the truck was going under? Well, there's a tree like that that's this much off the ground, and you come along, it just squeegees you off the, uh, of the boat into the water. And if you go into the water and get swept underneath the banks, you know, that's it. So you didn't really want to do that. Uh, one of the scariest times was when one of the boats missed the turn and went down the wrong uh, uh, sort of alley, if you will, and we had no idea what was there. Uh, you know, what, there could be a tree like that. Well, they fortunately they survived, but it was, it was hairy. Uh, ah, well, 
we took, uh, yeah, let's talk about stuff. TR went towards the heavy. I mean, look what they were wearing in these tents and everything. I mean, they really carried stuff down. We were much lighter. Uh, <laughs> you had your choice. You could be in a tent or you could be in a fly. Now, the problem, the good thing about a tent is it kept the insects out. Uh, but the bad thing about it is it was hot and lumpy and you were close to each other, there wasn't much room. The fly was much cooler. You could sleep in a hammock, which you had, there's a trick to learning how to do that, but you could sleep in a hammock. And, uh, but of course, the insects could get at you. So like everything else in the Amazon, you pays you money and you take your choice. <laughs> Talk a little about food. Uh, this was very early in the trip, so we still actually had some fresh melons. But we were relying on space food, you know, that stuff that you put in water. And we made what we called glop. And so we had beef glop, shrimp glop, you know, pork glop, chicken glop, <laughs> fish glop, and then you started over again. And it was just a big mix of all this stuff. And sometimes you had rice and sometimes you had noodles. Well, there were some problems. First of all, with the rice, we'd bought it locally, and our brilliant uh, leader had bought it uh, by the pound locally, and the locals knew that rice weighed more if it had a lot of pebbles in it. And so the rice had a lot of little pebbles in it, which was great for our teeth. Uh, and as to the glop, uh, another genius had to, you remember those trucks? We put all the food in one truck and there was some extra space, so we put jerry cans of, of the little bit of fuel we took with us, a little gasoline. So we had gasoline-laced pork glop and shrimp glop. And it's a good thing none of us smoked. Uh, <laughs> So that was the food. Uh, did our own laundry, uh, you know, all that stuff. Clothing, I'll only say one quick story about clothing. Uh, I, we were going to a rainforest, and so the umbrella was something of an idea, but how do you get an umbrella? I thought a nice raincoat. So I got a raincoat, and I bought a bright red raincoat. And the first time I broke it out, uh, uh, the doctor, John Walden, uh, saw me, and he said, ah, oh, I see you got a raincoat. Why did you pick red, he said. And I said, well, I picked red because I figured you know, if it was downpour and I somehow got separated from everybody, you know, I'd be easier to find if I had a red raincoat. He said, yeah, you know, that's a good idea. He said, but also, Tweed, did you know that insects are attracted to red? <laughs> <laughs> and so everywhere I went with my red raincoat, whenever I wore it, he was not far by. The insects all just shot by him and went, went to me. River looking better here. You can see we're beginning to get wider. It was. Uh, <laughs> the rain period. You go down during the rain because you wanted the water to be high so that you could get over the sticks and things that were in it. Uh, I hate that picture. <laughs> that actually was in life, but the reason I put it there is that there's a rapids there. There were some rapids even we couldn't go through. Uh, there's a waterfall there, you see. So look and see how he got that beautiful, uh, uh, um, Mark was a wonderful photographer. So we had to go around him. So there we are. You could carry the Avon rafts, you know, they weighed about 100 pounds. Sometimes we had to deflate them. We'd build a little road or path by it. Uh, but, you know, you could do it. It was reasonable. Uh, but TR had dugouts, and they weighed 2,500 to 3,000 pounds. And so they had to drag them around these rapids. Uh, and first they, you know, they dragged them out. They had a block and tackle that they used, which they eventually lost. Uh, they then had to bring them down what they called these corduroy roads. They'd cut trees and make rollers uh, and pull them, pull them around. This was really tough. This is where I was beginning to realize you know, how much more of a challenge it was for our predecessors and how much, uh, you know, much more difficult it was for them. And furthermore, they had, to, they had, I think, I forget now, I think it was nine boats or seven boats, whatever it is, they had to replace them all as they went down, because they got caught in the rapids and broken and so on. So they had to build these things, and the way you built them was you chopped a tree down, and you know, the old-fashioned way, and burned them out. Uh, and uh, they were real tough. Uh, well, we portaging, they portaged, let's see, we portaged about, I think it was six times. They portaged something like 28 times. So. Big, big difference, but portaging was no fun at all. That's Kelly, the woman, uh, carrying, what, three or, three or four oars there and an 80-pound pack on her back. <laughs> you know, I could bear, this is, uh, you know, where I learned that the 44 pounds made some sense. And, you know, I tried various stratagems. I, I had some books, you know, and I'd say to one of my colleagues, have you read this book? <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, and in fact, if you went to this place, 
now, you'd find all sorts of junk <laughs> left there that uh, we decided that we didn't really need. Now, there we are. There's one of us wading through the, uh, through the water, which, you know, would cool you down, seem nice. But remember those stingrays. Well, that was just one thing in the water. This was also the area. Piranhas were made famous by T.R. in his book. And this was the area of the black piranha, which is a particularly vicious version of the piranha, which is about, you know, full grown, is maybe 12 to 15 inches long. Uh, but they're vastly overrated uh, in, as dangerous fish. I mean, we ate far more piranhas than they ate of us. And, <laughs> you know, I, I remember bathing with an Indian fishing next to me, pulling piranhas out of the water, which makes you a little nervous, but after a while you really got to bathe somewhat. Uh, but that's nothing to the kandaroo, which is a fish uh, that is almost microscopic. It's a tiny, tiny little, it's called the toothpick fish. Also, it's a tiny little toothpick-shaped fish. It's a catfish, and it's a, uh, uh, pre uh, 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 not predator, what do you call it, Paras parasitic fish. And it would, it was supposed to sort of go into the gills of fish and, and glom onto them, and you know, get stuck in there, and it had its fins, which were very, you know, didn't bend and were backward facing and sharply pointed at the end, and the same thing with their tail, which looked like sort of an umbrella going the other way, uh, all to lodge themselves in there so that they'd be stuck. Now, this fish was rumored to follow urine trails. Uh, this made particularly the men think second about things. Well, I had heard about this fish, and just before I left, uh, some friends of mine threw a goodbye party for me. And uh, I noticed that a whole bunch of doctors came to this goodbye party, and I thought, gee, that was nice, until I realized they were looking at the patient before he got sick, you know, <laughs> so they could see him in both conditions. Well, a good friend of mine happens to be a urologist, and I said, oh, the kangaroo, you know, it's a myth, isn't it? He said, oh, quite to the contrary. He says, in fact, in last month's uh, Wilderness Medicine Journal, <laughs> there was an article about it. Before I could stop him, he said, I'll send it to you. <laughs> So the next day on my fax machine arrives this grisly article. You know how those medical journal articles are. They show all kinds of grisly pictures uh, of what, you know, this fish. And by the time you read through the article, you were absolutely convinced that it existed. And at the end of those articles, they always have an, a little section where, you know, the, they, the, whoever wrote the article is telling doctors uh, who are unfortunate enough to have a patient that's suffering from this disorder, if you want to call it that, what to do. And the operative word was amputation. <laughs> so we didn't go stay in the water very long over that either. Uh, this is what the Indians call a bridge. Now that's the doctor. He's, you know, 50, 45, whatever it was, trips, he'd been down there. He could walk across this thing. I, you never see a picture of me walking across that. I went so fast I'd blur even the fastest thing to get across it. Uh, but once you got around, you know, this was tough life uh, uh, carrying all that stuff. But when you got back on the water, it was, you know, it was pretty lovely. You can see it's getting much wider there. There I am rather enjoying this. Although you see how stringy his hair is, uh, give you an idea of the thing. Now this is an interesting picture. That whole river there, let's see if we can make this go back, that whole river, and you can't quite see all of it, is going through that one spot. Uh, no idea, you know, usually it broke out into a number of different channels, but that was one spot. Uh, and I have a picture from before, which is neat. Uh, there's George Cherry, the naturalist. I don't know what the significance is. He's holding a rifle, and I'm holding a, a butterfly net. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know what that means. Uh, but an interesting thing about this, that somebody in the audience once pointed out, I didn't notice at the time, you see this little sort of puff there of foam? Uh, well, it's still there. Isn't that amazing? Uh, now, this is perhaps the most famous picture from the first expedition. It looks like a stump, but it's actually a rock. <coughs> and there's uh, Colonel Rondon and T.R. standing in a, on it. And after considerable effort, uh, we, let's go the right way, we managed to find it. Uh, it was not near the river, actually. I mean, it wasn't far, but it was like three or 400 yards from the river. That's me with the doctor there. Quite something. You know, it's a, I'm not a mystical type guy, uh, but 
you know, the, I was probably, you know, the last person to stand there was probably T.R. and Ron Don. Uh, so that was some feeling. Uh, and I did feel some of this. You know, I'd been to North Dakota, which T.R. loved, and I'd been here, which T.R., you know, was a very difficult trip for him and by no means loved. Uh, and you did feel a difference uh, uh, about it. Well, bugs. Let's talk about bugs. Uh, those are, uh, Af you know, killer bees, Africanized honeybees. Uh, they, they don't kill you, uh, but it's no fun to get, as I did one morning, get stung 17 times before breakfast. Uh, so, but that's nothing to this problem. Now, these are little stingless bees, so they can't sting you. And when you read the explorers, if you will, uh, stories of their expeditions, their venom is held for these. They don't care about the African, you know, the honeybees. They say about these. I said, well, what difference does it make? You know, they're stingless. Well, the difference is that they come in their thousands, and they have they crawl in your nose, crawl in your in your ears, and you breathe them in, and they're in your eyes, and they somehow communicate with people so that the next day there's twice as many of them. <laughs> uh, and you know, we could portage around a, a rapids in two days. So we were exposed to two days of them. TR took often six days or seven days, and I don't know how they put up with these things. These were just awful. Uh, and then there's that. That's my back. Uh, uh, and the result, you know, you didn't go around with my shirt off. The only time you took a shirt off is if you went in for debate and right out, you know, or very quickly you took it off. So I got all those bites in, you know, 10 seconds. Uh, and uh, now, TR, we, we took, you know, various anti-bug stuff, worked pretty well. TR had some, too. It was called, uh, you know, bug dope or something. It worked fairly well, but nothing like our stuff. We had, uh, you know, the very, like, DEET. DEET is the active ingredients in all this stuff you spray on yourself. Thing to know about DEET, you know, typical Americans who want everything extra strength and so on, so, you know, you can go and buy 100% DEET if you want. Problem with 100% DEET, if you put it on plastic, say, like a plastic rope on a hammock, it'll burn right through it, just like that. Uh, and so imagine what it does to your skin. Uh, you should not use any DEET that's more than about 30% DEET, probably 20% is good enough. But it does work against um, the bigger insects, flying insects, like mosquitoes and so on. But it doesn't work very well against these noceums, which they call peums. And the problem with peums, these bites last for weeks. I mean, it's not like a mosquito bite. You know, you, know, you scratch for well, maybe a week or so. Uh, but in those days, and now there, it is marketed as an anti-bug thing, there was a thing called Skin So Soft. And you know, you do it, now they do it. Well, Skin So Soft, the way it works, it's no good against the bigger flying insects. The way it works against these little noceums is the noceums, you know, it's kind of this greasy stuff you put on you, and the noceums land on you, and then the greasy stuff wicks up their legs and smothers the bastards. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, you have piles of them on you. That's a very satisfying sort of thing. Uh, the problem is that they kind of negate each other, so you have to wear one or the other, and that's always a problem. But uh, and you could have that. You know, it was really very pleasant. The water was great. People ask me about drinking. Drinking water out of rivers is bad because somebody up river is dumping something in it. Well, there wasn't anybody upriver dumping anything in it, so this was, water was fine. But our genius of a, of a guy who organized for us, he decided to get uh, this ceramic uh, device that you were supposed to filter the water through that was so finely filtered that it would filter out viruses. But this is water full of, how do you say that, detris, de I can never pronounce that word, you know, stuff. And so it would clog up immediately. So you spend, and it was very hard to clean. So it would take you all day to make a glass of water out of it. <laughs> so that didn't work. And you know, boiling water didn't work and everything. Really, the most effective thing I found was uh, iodine pills. Now, iodine pills really work. You can, I wouldn't recommend this, but you can take sewerage water, strain it, put iodine pills in it, leave them there for half an hour and drink the stuff and survive. Uh, wouldn't want to do it, but you could. I loved iodine pills because I'd put it in my canteen and let it you know, fill out. It's not so much that it protected me, it's just made the water taste like scotch. Uh, <laughs> and so that was a big benefit. Uh, now, 
I'm an entomologist by uh, long training, not professional amateur am entomologist. And so I was collecting insects for the American Museum of Natural History, which was really a wonderful experience for me because nobody had ever collected insects in this area, and I got the chance to do it. Uh, and some of them were fabulous. I have a couple of pictures here. I call this a dan dancing hemiptera, its little things there. Those, those were to attract birds to bite that instead of them. Uh, it was a protective device. Uh, here's a, a weevil, but look at its beautiful color. Now the reason I have this, uh, you know, plastic, because you quickly learn in the Amazon, if you can see it, don't touch it, because it's obviously protected somehow, and I wouldn't take any chances here. Uh, nothing unusual about that. You can see that shortly here. It's a grasshopper coming out of it. It's going through one of its cycle steps, coming out of its exoskeleton, pulling itself out. Nothing unusual particularly about that, except this. Uh, everything, you know, giganticism is a big deal down there. A lot, their, their otters, for example, are five feet long. Uh, they have all kinds, well, look at this. There's a praying mantis. You know, lots of huge things. Uh, uh, fish, you know, these enormous fish. Uh, we saw the pink dolphins, which are more or less normal size. The world's largest rat lives here. It's the size of a sheep. Uh, <laughs> So there are all kinds of kinds of things. Now, <laughs> I'm trying to, what I'm trying, that's a spider. Spiders aren't insects. Spiders have eight legs, insects have six legs. If you count here quickly, you'll see she, I knew she was a she, she only had six legs. That's because I had, was fighting her with this pair of tweezers, trying to get her, coax her into this jar here. But the real re reason for this picture, you notice true value? <laughs> I was going to sell this to True Value as an ad. <laughs> You'll notice it played very well on the <laughs> thing. It never worked. Uh, now, I was collecting insects. And during the day, you couldn't collect much because we only stopped occasionally. So I was, my plan was to collect at night. And I had taken with me uh, a small light and a little tiny generator and some fuel, that famous fuel that went on our food, to run the generator at night so I could burn a light so I could attract the insects to the light. So I realized before I left I was proposing to run a noisy generator in the middle of camp all night with the sole purpose of bringing as many insects as I possibly could <laughs> to the center of camp. And I thought, even I realized that this wouldn't make me particularly popular with my buddies. And so I figured, try to figure out what to do about that. Well, now the problem with collecting insects in the Amazon is it's so humid that you can't dry them like you do here. So you have to preserve them in some kind of liquid. And you have a number of choices. Uh, you can use formaldehyde, uh, which is what they put bodies in, you know, and it's pretty effective. You can use something called carbon tetrachloride, which is what cleaners use on your clothes, also pretty effective. You can use wood alcohol, equally effective, or you can use grain alcohol. And so I took grain alcohol. Now this is laboratory grade, 100 percent grain alcohol. In other words, 200 proof vodka uh, <laughs> is what it was. And uh, you know, I filled up these jars, as you saw, you can sort of see, so this kind of jar here, right to the top with them. And when it came time to collect, I had to pour some liquid out. And if there was a cup underneath it, who cares? <laughs> so uh, th every night, this was, my colleagues called this the killing fields. Uh, <laughs> every night they would troop up uh, and stand there with their cups <laughs> waiting. And of course, I could try, and boy, was I popular. They didn't care how many insects I was going to bring. And after, you don't need very much 200 proof vodka to get a buzz. And I, uh, uh, you know, there they were. We only had tang to mix with it, but nobody seemed to care. Uh, and uh, after a shot or two of those, you didn't care whether you were bitten all night or not. So I, I became, I'd solved that problem. Here I am with Odomita. He knew all about the wildlife there. He was a Central Arga Indian. He knew all about this stuff. I showed him this book, and the only thing he didn't seem to know about was insects. And I was kind of surprised about that until I realized I'd given him, shown him the book of the families of insects of North America. So <laughs> no wonder. Now he could go without a shirt on. Some people, the insects don't bother at all. It's not racial. Uh, it's because uh, insects are terrible, uh, terrible bother to. Uh, to uh, many Indians. In fact, Walden told me a story once. He was trekking with the Indians. He did his doctoring on these things, too. He came into a village that had never seen outsiders before. 
They were horribly bitten by, uh, by insects, covered with welts. They'd have been all their lives that way. So he gave them some Benadryl or some equivalent thing, and it cleared it up, you know, and the first time in their lives they hadn't itched. And he left them a bunch of Benadryl. Well, six months later, he came back to this village, or sometime later, he came back to this village, walked into the village, they take one look at him, and they try to kill him. Uh, because, <laughs> you know, they'd run out of Benadryl, and when they ran out of Benadryl, they realized how uncomfortable <laughs> they'd been, whereas before they thought it was just, you know, normal. Uh, and so, interesting story. Uh, they're more giganticism. I mean, here's a longhorn beetle. Uh, and I'm taking my, you know, notes for collecting notes. But the, again, the purpose of this, you know, all these things I thought maybe somebody would, uh, would buy as an ad. And there are my kids, too, which I mentioned earlier, which I took them. Uh, so there I am writing my notes. But the real reason for that was there's TR, gauntlets and all. Sick as he was, sick as he was, he wrote the book uh, Through the Brazilian Wilderness a five to six hundred page tome. I mean, it's a really big book. He wrote the entire book on the trip. So that when he arrived at the bottom, he shipped it out and it was published before he got back to the United States. <sighs> Impressive. Uh, there they are making fun of me, having been up all night, and they're sort of laughing at me. Uh, and now we went during the rainy season, and sometimes it rained, and sometimes it really rained, uh, but we were pretty lucky about the weather. Uh, and there's beautiful scenes along the edge. Uh, now, uh, TR didn't see Indians. We did see some. We stopped at one village. This was an interesting village. That was TR before the trip, you know, on the high Alta Planta. Here they are. They, they had trade routes to the outside world, although many of them had never seen a white before. Uh, and they're the mothers. So you see the clothing they have. And uh, there's Otomita in the river behind us. That's what the river looks like there. They didn't, these are not river Indians, so they don't go on the rivers. Uh, there they are inside, you know, they're eating uh, uh, sloth and uh, animals like that. But I love his t-shirt, which said, America, USA. <laughs> when we arrived in the village, the first, you know, this, there were only two villages along the way. When we arrived at the village, went into the village, there was nobody there. And you know, I'd read about how explorers come to things, the Indians are terrified of them, and they go off and hide in the woods until they pass. Well, it was a village of maybe 20, 30 huts like that. Uh, finally, in one of the remote huts, there are all the villagers, and they'd somehow brought in a little generator, and they had a satellite dish and a television set, <laughs> and they were watching Star Trek. <laughs> now, it was, there was Captain Kirk, it was the old Star Trek. There was Captain Kirk spouting away in Portuguese. <laughs> and of course, they didn't speak Portuguese. God knows what they made of this. But they were absolutely mesmerized in, in looking at this. Uh, extraordinary scene. There's uh, uh, the other Indian with us. Uh, and he knew a great deal about, uh, about what was going on around there. But we come to the issue of snakes. Uh, now, I had thought that when I was, went down there, you know, there would be snakes all over the place, you know, they all over those dripping from trees, snakes over. And experienced guys told me, now nah, you'll never see a snake. Well, they're wrong. Uh, <laughs> and the reason they're wrong is because we had the Indians with us and they could spot them. You might not spot them. The only one you'd spot is after you stepped on it. Uh, and we worried about snakes because, uh, you know, they bite you. <laughs> and there are a lot of venomous ones down there. And, uh, uh, you know, I said to the doctor once, uh, you know, you brought the anti-venom, didn't you? And he said, no. I said, what do you mean, no? I thought you were a competent doctor, you know, you can break the anti-venom. He said, well, the problem with anti-venom is it has to be specific to the snake, and there are hundreds of snakes down here, and it has to be refrigerated, and there's obviously no way to do that. And uh, so I said, well, what do you plan to do if one of us gets bitten? And he says, well, the latest thought about this is cattle prods. Cattle prod? I said, what are you, are you kidding? Cattle prods? He said, no, the idea is that you take a cattle prod, you turn it up to high, and you zap the poor guy that's been bitten by the snake right where he's been bitten. And I said, my God, doesn't that hurt? And he says, oh, yeah, it hurts. <laughs> and he said, uh, I said, well, does it do any good? And he said, well, I don't know. He says, probably doesn't, but at least it'll keep your mind on the problem. <laughs> uh, uh, there's a snake. 
we were on the rubber boats all day. They were self-bailing, so they were full of water all the time, you know, going right out. So we were barefoot. So we were barefoot. We were barefoot all day in the boat, and I discovered this snake, which is called the Fer de Lance, which is a deadly snake. The, local, the locals in Brazil call it the two-step, because they say after it bites you, you have two steps before you're a goner. Actually, <laughs> actually you have about a day. Uh, and this had been in our boat. Well, unfortunately, it hadn't bitten any of us. Been in the boat all day. I just killed it, although not all that successfully, as you can see there. There's the experienced boatman who's looking at me as if I'm crazy for holding this thing. I was holding because the cameraman said, hold it, hold it. So, yeah, all right, you tell me to hold it, I'll hold it. So we were lucky. Now, what was the plan about, uh, about uh, there's a Brazilian kid at the lower end when we got to the area. In that Indian village, there was an Indian who had been bitten by a snake. The doctor said he'd never seen the fang marks so far apart. You know, they were about that far apart. And he was a dead man. This kid was also. I mean, if you can get you to a hospital quickly, you can probably be saved. But if you can't, so, you know, our only hope if that or if some other major thing happened to us was communications to the outside world. Our first thing was this satellite radio kind of thing, which was great. You know, it had a little phone. You could pick it up, push a button, and somebody would say, AT&T, can I help you? Or now, whatever they say, Verizon, can I help you? Uh, problem was, th this weighed 500 pounds, and you needed 500 pounds of, you know, other stuff with it. So that obviously didn't work. So the next step was something called a single sideband radio, which is a great device. If you set it up properly, you can talk to you know, people not too far away. Problem was, we didn't set it up right, uh, so it didn't communicate with anybody. The next thing is there are two-way radios, you know, those little two-way radios, uh, that can communicate to an airplane cockpit 50 miles away. Problem was, there were no planes down there. We never saw a plane. And second, anyway, we got something from Circuit City that was the 1995 version, $19.95 version, that we couldn't even talk to each other in. So we were left with this. Now, that's called an EPIRP. Uh, an EPIRP is a device that sailors use that when it goes into the water, it sends a beam from this device up to a satellite somewhere. And in our case, it sends it down to the Canadian Army. Who, it doesn't, it's not a voice signal, it's just a you know, beep, beep, beep signal. And that would alert them that we were in trouble and they were to supposedly to mount a worldwide effort to come and rescue us uh, if they got this signal. Well, the first problem was this thing is the aircraft carrier size. There's one that's equally effective that's the size of a cigarette pack, but he chose to take this one. Well, this is the communications guy and he's the guy responsible for all the screw-ups on all those other things and he's telling us uh, about this one and it, how it can do that and blah 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 and uh, and he said I'll, we said why why do you think this is going to work and he said oh it will it will and I'll show you I'll test it we said well if you test it won't it alert and I said no no it won't it's uh, you know there's a test mode and he said well what if you set it off accidentally he said ah it's idiot proof well, you can see what people <laughs> think of that <laughs> of their description of this fellow well he did test it and sure enough it sent a signal up to a satellite. And sure enough, it got to the Canadian military uh, uh, to alert them to come rescue us. And nine days later, nine days later, <laughs> this arrives. Well, as you can see, it has its pontoons on so it can land in the water. And if you want to see what it looks like around, there are not many airfields there for it to land. So this flew around and then the pilot or the, you know, whatever, threw out a Coke bottle that came splash into the water. And we picked up the Coke bottle, and in the Coke bottle was a message. And the message said, are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't quite, <laughs> we didn't know how to respond to that. Uh, we waved a paddle at them, and they wiggled their wings and flew off, and that was the end of them. Uh, and the worldwide effort to rescue us. Uh, fortunately, we hadn't been bitten. Uh, we did have some medical problems, uh, and these started appearing, these sort of nasty things. And the doctor looked at them and he said, oh, it isn't presenting quite like leishmaniasis, but I think it probably might be. And uh, uh, Now, leishmaniasis is a bacterial disease that uh, it's kind of like leprosy. You know, you get it for a while, eventually your nose falls off and things like that. Uh, the doctor was very excited about this, you know. <laughs> you get pictures of it, you know. And, but unfortunately, people didn't show it to him until after it was fully developed. Well, I started developing a spot somewhere 
So I go to the doctor, and he's delighted because he can see, you know, he can get a whole series of pictures from beginning to end. So he's taking pictures, and he's all excited. He's carrying on about all this. And I said, well, doc, I don't give a damn about your pictures. He said, what are you going to do about curing it? Well, he'd given certain antibiotics, so I insisted he double the thing. And, and so the thing grew, 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 and then shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And he was really disappointed because he didn't get his picture series of this. Uh, well, this guy, uh, you know, several people got it. It disappeared, except for one guy. Uh, who had it still at the end of the expedition, and then uh, uh, we sent him to uh, Walter Reed, I think it was, or anyway, someplace like that. And just like these tropical things, it came and it went, and they never figured out what it was. Uh, but at least he survived. Uh, beautiful scenes along the river. Uh, we're now, you know, look at that, isn't that gorgeous? Uh, we're, see how wide it is here, too. We're now getting down to the flat part. And there, there are a few homesteads, I think is the best way to say it. A few homesteads of these Brazilians. This particular group of people were collecting Brazil nuts, <laughs> interestingly enough. I guess they weren't having an off year, and they were waiting at one of the rapids for somebody. You know, they'd been there a week or two, waiting for somebody to come along and help them down, so we did that. Uh, and there are these, oh yeah, there he is with his spears. It's a good thing I didn't see his face. Uh, <laughs> Actually, they're absolutely marvelous people. I mean, they would quite literally lay down their lives for each other or for us uh, if they had to. Uh, here's a, one of the little settlements. TR passed about, I think it was about 60 or 65 settlements in a 300-mile stretch of flat area. We only passed maybe 15 or 20. There were a lot less people there now. And it was typically a family uh, like this. There I am. Those are grapefruits. The Brazilians don't like grapefruits, and somebody had slipped this guy a grapefruit seed, so he grew a grapefruit tree. So he didn't care. He was delighted for us to take these grapefruits. Uh, and the reason for the big smile is, you remember the tang? This is a big improvement <laughs> over tang. <laughs> big improvement over tang. Now, who could go on a trip like this without you know, commemorating, there we are, Rio Roosevelt and all that, and TR was the same. Uh, uh, those are the paddlers. They didn't, the officers, so to speak, weren't part of that. Uh, and there we were at the bottom. Now, the difference between our trip and TR's trip is we had TR's excellent maps. So we knew where we were, and we knew where we were getting near the end. And two or three days before we got near the end, I thought to myself, and the end was, there was a, a road here, sort of, uh, and one little, I mean, tiny little, settlement. Practically nothing there. It's like a house. Uh, and I thought to myself, what am I going to do when I get out, you know, at the bottom? What's going to be the first thing I'm going to do? You know, is it going to be a big frosty cold beer? Is it going to be, you know, a steak? What's going to be the first thing? <laughs> what a relief it was, I might say. Uh, so, uh, I can't show you the last, I've always had trouble with this last slide, but uh, this trip was, we were pretty successful. We managed to get everybody down alive, first of all. Second of all, uh, we managed to uh, get the Brazilian scientists in there, and they were able to get in later to do some of their work. Uh, and we were able to talk about it and have some effect on the views about, about uh, what to do about the Amazon professionally and not professionally. Uh, so I think our trip was pretty successful. TR's also, he got out alive, and he got his son out alive. I did lose about 25 pounds, which was a help. I've unfortunately gained it all back again. But anyway, that's what happens on weight loss clinics. Uh, well, you know, somebody, think of how I feel about this trip is similar. TR sort of summed it up, I think, when somebody asked him, you know, what did you think about the trip? And his answer, I think, is, similar to what I felt about the trip and maybe what I hope you feel about my talk. TR said with somebody, what did you think of the trip? And he said, typical TR, he said, it was bully while it lasted, but it lasted long enough. <laughs> Thank you. You want to do an A? Or, well, it's up to you. It's uh, you know, it's eight thirty. A couple. Sure. Good. Let's uh, take a couple of questions. Anyone? Those of you that want to leave, go ahead. Just curious. I didn't hear you say anything about crocodiles. 
he's asking about crocodiles. Uh, Cayman, they have there actually, which are Cayman. Yeah, there are lots of them, uh, but not anything like uh, some of the other pictures you've seen there. But sure, there are plenty of Cayman. Uh, there are plenty of, they're not particularly dangerous. They're tapir, there are, there are lots of monkeys. Uh, big game we never saw. And we didn't see any signs of big game either. It doesn't mean it wasn't there. Uh, but, uh, you know, so be it. But plenty of crocs. He wrote the book. Yeah, it wasn't a journal, it was a book. If you see the book, it's this thick. It's actually a good read. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, when people write adventure books, you know, they've been on some adventure, they do it afterwards, so they have the hindsight. When he wrote this, he wrote it as he went along. So he didn't have the hindsight uh, that, you know, so you, you, know, you didn't know what was going to happen next. And he didn't know. It's an interesting way to do it. By the way, there's a woman named Candace Millard who used to work for National Geographic, and she's written a magnificent book about this, about TR's expedition. It's called uh, The River of Doubt, I think. Uh, TR and the River of Doubt, Darkest Journey or Most Dangerous, something like that. Candace Millard. And it's a very well-written book. She tells the story very well. And she, she had one brilliant insight at the end, which even the doctor hadn't thought of, none of us had thought of, and it had to do with the Indians on TR's trip. And her insight was, that the Indians could have killed them any time they wanted to. And they were completely in control of the situation. Uh, and they didn't. They made the conscious decision to let them through. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting insight to me. Now, these Indians were uh, the descendants of those Indians. And in fact, there was, a, you know, you saw, you, there was nothing left of the first expedition because the jungle eats it right up, except for one interesting thing. We knew where he had camped because the maps were brilliant. Best maps of these people, of our people had ever seen of a river. Absolutely gorgeous maps. So we often camped at the same spot, and there was a reason for that. You can't, where you camp is at the top of rapids. You go along during the day. You know, when you come to a rapid, you camp, and then you try to get around it the next day. So we knew where they were. The, one of the, uh, the botanists was able to take soil plugs out. And he could take a soil plug of an area which was, of course, canopy. And by looking at the striations, say, here's when this area was open, you know, open to the sun, because it had a different kind of striation. And, uh, and it, that's exactly the right time, because it would take, you know, so many inches to be at the time. But that was really the only thing we saw of the previous uh, uh, expedition. But at one stop, Othamita, the Indian, took me aside. He said, I want to tell you about our people remembering TR's trip. You know, we were told, as when I was a little boy, Othamita was too young to have been, uh, been there then, but when I was a little boy, it was part of our village lore that these white guys came by uh, at some time way back then. And they said, oh, this particular spot, he said, I want to tell you at this spot, this particular spot, uh, we have considered sacred. And the reason we considered it sacred, as we were watching TR and the company, I didn't even know it was TR, I mean, Odomita did, but they didn't know it was TR, watching this group, and we saw that they had a jewel-encrusted little statue, and they buried it here. So they must have thought this was an important site, so we did too, and so we left it there and always treated it as sort of sacred ground. <coughs> this seemed to me a very odd story, because of course they didn't bury a jewel-encrusted thing. And I thought about it, and what I thought about is, Probably what the Indians saw is they saw them, they saw TR's group burying the guy who was murdered. Uh, and the story had grown into as stories do. That was my best guess. It was the right spot. So that was my best guess about it. So there was some memory of this. Were the Canadians just being facetious, or were they trying to create a South American, the gods must be crazy? <laughs> Well, all the Canadians did was to call down to the Brazilians, and the Brazilians uh, knew about us. And so they, the Brazilians had sent in this little plane. But it was a kind of gods, it must be crazy. It was typical Brazilian. I mean, you know, it wouldn't do us any good, but. Uh. Is it something about Harvard that attracts its graduates to the River of Doubt, or is there some other cause? <laughs> no, no. That's why I should repeat, repeat the questions, I'm sorry. No, I mean, I was just tracing TR, so uh, it had nothing to do with Harvard. <laughs> and this expedition had nothing to do with Harvard. There's a lot of publicity about the fact that uh, the uh, rainforests in uh, South America are being 
destroyed. What's your observation about that? They're talking about the rainforest being destroyed, and a lot of publicity about it. <coughs> I mean, there's no doubt there's an effect, but you know, as usual, we overblow everything. There is, uh, it's huge. I mean, the, the basin there that I pointed out to you is the size of the lower 48 United States. So they talk about, you know, burning 1,000 acres a day. Well, think about trying to burn the United States at the rate of 1,000 acres a day. Serious problem of what to do about this, and I could go on at some length about micro environments and so on, but you got a real problem, you know. We can sit up here and say, well, why don't they save the Amazon? Well, a million people live in the Amazon. You've got to do something with them. You know, they make their livings off there. Uh, what are you going to do with these people? And so it's a very difficult problem. It's certainly a serious problem. But something, you know, the latest estimates are something like 87%, I think the last one I saw, of the Amazon is still uncut. Now, that's a big chunk. Uh, so there's time to do something. We need to do something, but you've got to solve the problem of a million people living there. Who was your grandfather? Archibald. My great grandfather, uh, my grandfather was Archibald. He was the next youngest son, and my father was Archibald Jr., and I'm me. <laughs> Let's do one more question. Anyone else? What year again was it? TR went down in 1914, I went down in 1992. Thank you very much. Thanks. On behalf of the Hauenstein Center, thank you for coming tonight.